Jenna, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Such a pleasure. So I've been reading uh, your book, Immunity, The Science of Staying Well. I absolutely loved the book. Um, I think that we maybe like for a great place to start, because as I just mentioned to you off here, we've never really done an episode on the immune system. We've kind of danced our way around it, but I figured it would be really cool to kind of go deep on this today. Um, in the book, I know you describe the immune system as the sixth sense, and you kind of talk about how it connects you to it connects your health, to your environment, to your feelings, to your emotions. Um, so I guess just start from the very ground up at a very basic level. What is the immune system and kind of what does it do? Yeah, it's a great place to start. And it's something that we, we've heard mentioned a lot in the last couple of years with COVID. Um, the immune system is not one thing. It's a whole constellation of different things in the body. So it's white blood cells. It's even things like our skin and the lining of our digestive tract, the, these barrier tissues to the outside world. Um, it's things like the lymphatic vessels that are carrying those white blood cells around. And it even includes things like the microbiome. So the collection of microbes that exist on and in our bodies. These are kind of the structural components of what the immune system actually is. Um, and as you said, I, I would describe it as the sixth sense because it is a sensing system. It's there like your, um, your nervous system in your brain to sense what's going on in your environment and be prepared for what might come so it can sense if you have a good uh, connection like a social connection lots of people around that makes you feel supported even um getting a sense that you are happy or content and then it's going to respond and say well this you know there's more chance of you catching a virus because you're around lots of people so therefore we'll up the antiviral defenses but for example people who are lonely we know that that actually has an, the opposite effect on the immune system because it's assuming that we're not near people we're not connected so we don't need um our immune defenses as as much um, so I really think of it as our wellness system, because there's really no physical or mental health condition that hasn't got a bit of our immune system involved. Uh, or maybe if there is, I'd, I'd challenge someone to find that and uh, let me know. Amazing. And I find this system to be one of uh, wonder, because we're very aware of, I guess, our heartbeats. We're very aware of our taste, of our touch, of our mm -hmm. physical organs. Uh, yeah. But we're not hyper aware of this magical system within us that is fighting illness um you know each and every day as you say in the book there's no medication in existence that protects us day in and day out like it but it doesn't seem to perhaps get the credit that it deserves yeah exactly and hopefully we can start thinking about it as something that's working hard for us every day and not just when we get those symptoms of you know the the latest lurgy that's going around um so i think you know people often come to me when they when they catch a cold or they get unwell and say what do i do and i'm like well what did you do before that because how you enter into an illness has a big effect on how you're going to come out of that illness. So it's really about nurturing your immune system every day. And I like to think of it as for the long game. So it's not just to get through the latest snot season. It's really because, you know, we want to have a long and healthy lifespan. We want to be feeling fit and healthy in, in our later years. And really, our immune system is a big part of that. Definitely. And I was thinking kind of before I read your book, um, if someone had asked me, what I kind of thought the immune system was. Um, I'd be imagining this kind of network within us that protects us from illness, protects us from disease. And the key word there that comes to my mind is the word protect, almost kind of in a, a, a militaristic mm -hmm. um, sense. So I was kind of, I had this idea that, you know, uh, outside microbes they come into the body and then the system just goes to work at kind of zapping them down um you know that could obviously be germs or toxins or bacteria or whatever it is um but could you talk us through kind of well i guess first do you see that as kind of an accurate uh um concept and then also how do you kind of view the immune system compared to 
what I just described, if you will. Yeah, I think that's kind of the classic thinking of the immune system. Immunology as a discipline has sort of branched off of the older discipline of microbiology. So the study of microbes and germs that cause disease. And then with that later on in history, we had the discovery of these immune cells and that these were the ones that were responsible for fighting off these germs um, when they entered our body. So we definitely have that kind of um, uh, lens whereby it's germs cause disease and your immune system is, is there like this little army that's there to fight them off. Uh, and in some ways that's correct, but I do think maybe in the last sort of 15 years, the research has sort of broadened to show that the immune system has this really broad role in our day to day well being. And actually, you know, there's so many germs, there's germs in the air we're breathing right now. Um, there's germs on every surface that we touch, you know, and most of those are not making us sick. So it's it's like you, you, your immune system also has to tolerate things in the environment that are not dangerous. So I often think that half of your immune system is turning the other half off. So con normally it's it's in balance. And, you know, when you're healthy and well, it's actually maintaining balance in the body. It's stopping unwanted immune responses so that the, the peacekeepers are kind of playing down the army. And it's only when you do fall ill that the army then comes and expands and goes out to battle. But you you then need the peacekeepers to come along and dampen it all down again and bring everything back to homeostasis at the end. So it's really there's two arms uh, of your immune system. And so the military analogy is a useful one, but you with every military, you need to have the peacekeepers that are going to control that fight. I, I love I love that analogy. Uh, but you raised a really interesting point there, because I think that most people, when they hear the word germs, they go, oh, I don't, don't want any germs, but as you said, but not all germs are bad, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's a very small percentage of bacteria and viruses and parasites in our environment that will actually cause disease. But, you know, every surface that we touch, the air that we breathe, it's full of germs. Our bodies are covered in germs. We just can't see them. And then we have, you know, about two kilograms of germs located in the digestive tract. And these are very much up close and personal with the immune cells that line our digestive tract. And they're kind of having a conversation. And these germs are kind of training and educating the immune cells to stop them from responding inappropriately to these sort of more friendly germs. And actually, Actually, you know, there's a kind of misunderstanding uh, that we need to have exposure to infections to build our immunity. And that sort of works for some infections. So, for example, if you had chicken pox as a child, you probably will be left with a very long tail of immunity. That means you will never experience that infection again. But if you've had a, a cold, the durability of that immune protection is quite short. And that's just the nature of that interaction between the germ and your immune system. So there's a chance you could catch that cold again. Um, so it, we now know that what's building our immune system is exposure to those helpful, friendly environmental germs. So there's a lot of um, uh, evidence now that, you know, letting kids play in the dirt mm. is giving measurable improvements in their immune system um, that are going to take them, you know, through life. So it's not necessarily letting your kid get every cold under the sun. It's more letting them play in the dirt. So we're kind of having to flip this on its head a little bit because um, I think there's uh, the, the old adage about the hygiene hypothesis. I don't know if you've heard this. So we're too clean and that's why our immune system's gone a bit awry and we're getting allergies. So we need to get, you know, lots of contact with germs, but actually it's not the infectious disease germs, it's the helpful germs. So it's kind of been reframed now as what we call um, the old friends hypothesis, that we don't have enough contact with biodiversity in our environment, with these old friends, these helpful germs. And that is meaning that our immune systems are not being trained appropriately. And then we head down that trajectory of getting allergies and autoimmune and inflammatory conditions. Now, this is very interesting to me. And there's two things that I, I want to point out there. First of all, I was going to actually ask that question about mm. kids playing in the dirt, but you, you've clarified that very clearly. Sorry, I got in there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, but the other question I was going to ask was actually based on a personal experience. And I remember I was in um, a hostel in Bergen in Norway, um, and I met a Dutch guy in there. And this was sometime, 
uh, back in, uh, it was around about the time that, that COVID was, was kicking off. And anyway, and I was talking to this guy and just very casually in conversation, I mean, he dropped in that it was only since the emergence of the virus that he'd really started washing his hands when he would go to, to use public bathrooms. And I, I, <laughs> and I was a bit taken aback. And then he told me, he said, well, actually, he said, you know, in the Netherlands, it's kind of common because what we want to do is we want to build our immune systems up <laughs> by by no washing. And I just want to apologize to any of my Dutch listeners if this guy has told me a pack of lies. But if you Google <laughs> the hygiene rates in, in the Netherlands, it's it'll back up what this guy was saying. So I'm curious, was there any truth in what this man had told me? Or is it not backed by he, science? <laughs> yeah, I think he's kind of misunderstood it. I think that, you know, we don't, sadly, like, you know, those uh, are roots of, of germ transmission. So we call it the fecal oral route. So uh, things that happen in the bathroom, then followed by you inadvertently touch your face or, you know, prepare food um, and you're, increasing the likelihoods, especially if you're using public toilets, which are being used by lots of other people, that you might pick up some microscopic infectious disease germs and then um, either ingest them or pass them on to someone because germs like to spread through, you know, close contact with people coughing, sneezing, you know, through the mouth, all that kind of thing. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think going out and getting yourself some salmonella, it's probably not going to give you super immunity <laughs> but playing in natural environments getting into green space that sort of thing is, is more what we're looking for so gardening and you know digging in the dirt but the public hygiene I think you know that's that's revolutionized our health you know there's very few things that have had such a big step function change in improving our, our health and well-being and and you know things like in, in London when they realized where cholera was coming from in the water supply and then just cleaning that up and telling people to wash their hands after going to the bathroom meant that, you know, people were not dying from this awful disease. So, yeah, I think he's misunderstood it. But, yeah, I guess he's he's being experimental. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a bold hypothesis to test. But, I mean, and, and I, I think that's a great point because I, I can't remember what book it was that I read her in, but some some sort of lifespan book or something like this. But I think that in, in there they talked about how there was a dramatic upshift in human lifespan when for instance uh waste disposal trucks would come around and start taking people's rubbish away regularly mm -hmm. which i guess ties in nicely to what you're talking about about the importance of uh sanitation and yeah. hygiene in from the the negative guys in the the dutch public bathrooms yeah exactly you know we we kind of take it for granted now um but you know like uh, probably in the victorian times they had the, the children's rhyme you know coughs and sneezes cause diseases um and then the, this whole kind of idea of like washing your hands before cooking or being outside washing your hands after going to the bathroom um and then you know over the decades it's got a bit diluted and we forget the importance of that because you know in modern life we're quite protected from these really horrible infectious diseases you know with things like public health hygiene and vaccination we are not dying from the infectious diseases that our great grandparents were dying from um and you know things like antibiotics the, it, there's other consequences like the rise in inflammatory diseases and non-infectious diseases but you know i think it's easy to forget how lucky we are in somewhere like the uk um where you know you it's unlikely that you'll die just because you cut your finger and got some dirt in there but 100 years ago that might not have been the case yeah Absolutely. Um, so, so far, we've kind of talked about how um, the kind of immunology now is kind of looking at the immune system, kind of not so much in militaristic terms, but perhaps in more peacekeeper terms. We've kind of talked about how um, not all germs are, are, are bad. And, you know, there are some germs, for instance, as you said, they're kind of environmental healthy germs, kids playing in, mm -hmm. in you know, mud and, you know, the the... Uh, bacteria found in green spaces um, but I would love it if you could actually kind of just give us an actual like concrete image of um, what happened so let's imagine that perhaps someone is uh, someone shakes hands with someone else or um, you know they're at a nightclub two people are making out or, or god forbid someone gets sneezed on 
um, and then obviously the micro the microbes they pro, uh, proceed to invade the human um, so could you talk us through what happens next in terms of those microbes and then how the immune system uh, how they proceed to meet the immune system yeah, that's a good, it's a good uh, way to, to describe it, I think, uh, going really from that fundamental level. So it's important to remember that different germs will spread by different means, you know, the common cold is sort of going to be spread, you know, with coughing and sneezing, that kind of things. Some are spread through this, what we call the fecal oral route. So there's different ways that germs have evolved to spread. And, and I think it's also important to remember that, you know, we evolved in a world full of germs, you know, the germs that were here before us. And so that's why we have an immune system, because throughout evolution, we had to develop an immune system to protect us. So there's always been this to and fro battle. The germs are trying to find ways to evade our immune system and then our immune system's like right okay we've got to we've got to figure out a way to get back and, and get on top of it so say you breathe in um, a rhinovirus which causes the common cold um, into your airways uh, and they will infect the cells that line your airways so normally it's the upper respiratory tract so the upper part of the airways um, and the, the airways are made of a, a really delicate um, structure that's only one cell thick so there's these barrier cells between the air that you're breathing in and the rest of your body and it's it's structurally designed like that so that it can maximize transfer of oxygen and carbon dioxide but that means that it's quite vulnerable you know one cell thick between the, what you're breathing in and the rest of your body so these little viruses that you breathe in will infect these barrier cells and then what they do is they hijack the uh the machinery inside that cell to copy their own DNA or their own ge genetic material. And they'll start a little factory inside that cell making hundreds of copies. And then it'll burst out of that cell with all these new copies of viruses that are going to then start infecting all the neighboring cells. And you know, viruses can copy very quickly. So you can see how exponentially, before you know it, all of your airways are, are going to be full of little virus factories hijacking your cells. But what those cells will do when they get infected, they'll, they'll start to express different molecules on their surface as a kind of like a symbol of them being stressed and, and under pressure. And you you have underneath that barrier tissue, lots of immune cells sitting there waiting, surveying the whole environment, looking out for anything untoward, and they'll start to see that stress happening um, and the changes in these molecular patterns, um, which will turn on your immune cells. And this starts the cascade of what we call inflammation. So inflammation is uh, one of the very first early immune responses. And it basically starts to recruit in from the blood lots of other immune cells. So it's calling for backup. And they all start spitting out really toxic um, components that's trying to combat the germ, trying to kill it, make it the environment very hostile for it. It's quite a non-specific response, this early response. So it's just in there, feet first, you know, you know imagine that military analysis just throwing out bombs here there and everywhere to try and stop the destruction from the virus but it causes our own tissues a lot of collateral damage and that's actually when we start getting symptoms as soon as your immune system kicks off um, and so you've got that balance whereby you don't want to cause too much damage to the airways or you won't be able to breathe anymore but you do need to get on top of this virus and then they'll call for backup from a special part of our immune system called the adaptive immune system, which consists of T and B cells. And people might have heard of these two cell types during COVID because there's a lot of discussion around these cells with the COVID vaccine, for example. Um, B cells produce antibodies, T cells kind of help other cells do their job better. And so these cell populations take about five to seven days to get up and running. So you've got that early inflammation causing loads of damage, and then the T and B cells come in later and they're very specific. So they're not just attacking any germ that happens to have sort of germy patterns on it. They're going to attack that specific germ and the antibodies are going to be coming out from the B cells that are going to stop the virus from infecting new cells. And then at the end, when, when the immune system's got on top of that infection, these more peacekeepers are going to come in, start to repair the damage, resolve the inflammation and bring the tissue back to, to the normal state again. And that's an, an ideal situation, what should happen. 
I love it. I love it. That, that's very, very detailed. I, I, I love the, the clarity there. Um, I just want to pick up on something that I was thinking about. In terms of um, perhaps if we're breathing in germs, if we breathe through our nose as opposed to our mouths, does this limit or perhaps filter uh, the potential effect of or reduce the effect of us getting sick? That's a great question. We are actually meant as humans to breathe through our nose. Luckily, we have the ability to breathe through our mouth as well, because sometimes if you have a cold, your nose is blocked. Um, but you're right, the nose allows the air to be filtered. There's obviously lots of sticky mucus up there and hairs and different things that can try and clean the air before it enters the lungs. So that nasal cavity is a really important part of your first line immune defense. Um, we also know that breathing through the nose increases things like nitric oxide as a gas. Um, this is an, very antiviral. It also plays important roles in things like our, our blood vessels. Um, and so we know that people who are mouth breathers, particularly at night, this can be quite uh, detrimental to our, our health. So the, the breathing through the mouth is kind of the backup for when the nose is blocked. Um, I think it's more of a problem for people who suffer with chronic sinusitis or allergies where the nose might be constantly blocked and they're having to breathe through their mouth for you know large periods of the year so um i think if anyone is struggling with that definitely worth getting checked out because you are just having that little bit more vulnerability to infections yeah, i love that i love that um one one of the things actually that made me laugh in the book that I would like since we're on the topic of noses that you put in the book uh, there was a, a little subhead and it said should you pick your nose <laughs> so <laughs> I would love to to ask that question to you since we're since we're on this topic. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you've ever observed little kids, you know, they um, <laughs> they often have these, what, you know, what we would probably class as more unsavory habits. And, they, you know, very young kids will just put everything in their mouth. Um, <laughs> and it's almost, uh, some have suggested that it may be a way of sampling your environment. So it's kind of giving that input to your immune system about what might be in your environment. <laughs> so there perhaps is an argument for um, why it might be good for immune system. And I think there's some um, primates that, that do that as well. So although it might be not very um, uh, publicly acceptable, <laughs> there may be a reason, <laughs> particularly in childhood when that immune system's really developing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, pick the, the social setting that you do it in, but I, I, I see that. Um, I would love to kind of ask you uh, just about your work. So obviously this reading this book was really the um, it was kind of the first uh, introduction uh, that I, I kind of had to your work. Um, but considering the timing that you read uh, the book, uh, that you wrote the book, um, I know that, for instance, just two weeks ago, America, they announced that I think that over 1 million people of their citizens had died of COVID. But obviously COVID is a new uh, virus, but you go back throughout human history, there's a long list of, of other viruses. Obviously there was a Spanish flu and smallpox and HIV, the dengue virus, there's all kinds of other ones. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd be interested to know, has COVID, has this sparked more of an interest in uh, your work, obviously, with the people, you know, trying to a uh, moon boost and 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 whatnot since since yeah. sort of the pandemic started. I definitely think it put immunology firmly on the map because, as I said, it it it's, is quite a new discipline and it has branched off of microbiology, so it's it's still kind of evolving as a subject area, uh, and because of the breadth of things the immune system does. Um, I, I guess it didn't have it, that moment in the limelight really. Um, so it's been nice to do that. And it's it's been nice to watch the global immunology community really come together and really try to give clarity on the, this new virus. Um, and we're in a very different phase now in the whole pandemic because we're over two years in and so we understand a lot more the levels of immunity within a given population are higher because the exposure to the virus and people who've had the vaccine is higher so when the virus first came out and people were getting very sick nobody had prior immunity to this there may have been some crossover immunity from other coronaviruses 
but I guess, you know, we really didn't know what was going to unfold. So some of the strategies, the short term strategies that were used to mitigate COVID spread might have seemed quite archaic and a bit, uh, you know, problematic in themselves. But I, I, it was just, you know, dealing with the unknown. And I'm quite sympathetic to public health professionals because you've got to make those big decisions. Public health is not the same as personal health. So the things that you do for a whole population are maybe not the things you would do for a given individual. But it's definitely put immunology on the map. And I think it's a good reminder that although in the UK, you know, for example, where we are right now, we don't, um, we don't die from infectious diseases in the same way that our great grandparents do. It reminds us that they're, they are still an issue. You know, even things like the common cold has a huge burden in terms of the economic burden, time off work, this, you know, spending on cold and flu medicines, that kind of thing. So it was kind of a reminder, like you say, the reminder of washing your hands and how germs spread kind of, uh, you know, it was a good nudge in that direction. But what it also did was to elevate um, the importance of other aspects of our health in our susceptibility to infection. And I know there's been a lot of criticism about this, but early on in the pandemic, the WHO did come out and say that healthier people seem to be more able to fight off um, COVID-19 infection. What a shock. Recover. What a shock. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, of course, we have those stories of very healthy people who don't have risk factors ending up with very severe disease and there will always be outliers in everything but generally speaking you know being of a healthy weight having a certain you know level of health and fitness eating a diet that's going to furnish your immune system with everything it needs you know managing your stress and having good sleep hygiene and all that kind of thing those are the, the best tools we can do to reduce the risk of a, an infection being very burdensome when we're looking at things like COVID or cold and flu, that kind of thing. So it's been interesting from that perspective because there's just been so much going on in the, the online world. In fact, I actually started, I actually stopped posting about COVID on social media because it was so exhausting, all of the different opinions that would come flooding in and people in my DMs, just, uh, you know, and I'm like, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm agnostic to a lot of things. I'm not trying to tell people what to do. I was just trying to convey the, the evidence as it was unfolding, but the volume of publications that were coming out on COVID was was just huge and lots of them were preprints and I, you know I have my own um research and work to do I just couldn't keep on top of it anymore and I decided to you know observe from afar the research but not really actively follow it because I didn't have the capacity to yeah and I, I think that it's a real interest in times we're living in at the moment in terms of how fast information has can spread and yeah. for instance over the last two years I've become uh, acutely aware that you know you go on Twitter and um, for instance now anybody with a Twitter account within you know a matter of weeks can become a leading expert yeah. in infectious disease or yeah. in uh, foreign policy or even in the last couple of weeks I've seen people become in legal experts with the Amber Heard and well, <laughs> Johnny yeah. Depp cases. So you're absolutely right. And we made a similar decision. We said, you know what, I said the, the COVID um, backlog and, and the kind of uh, the kind of Twitter debates and whatnot about it. We thought we'll, we'll do a couple of episodes on like tools and whatnot. But besides that, it's just it's just so so difficult to kind of like get involved in and mm -hmm. there's just too much to get so I I totally get it mm -hmm. totally get it um, but one of the things I think that kind of like really highlighted uh, the power of the immune system to me um, was something that I would kind of love to to ask you about and that was that I had a, an incident during um, uh, during the first lockdown in which I was, um, I come into contact with someone uh, that had COVID and I was with someone else and they had, and they more or less the same amount of, uh, of contact. At the time, none of us had been vaccinated. Um, 
Uh, and I'm not not breaking any any rules here, just in case any any police <laughs> or anything are watching. But anyway, we both basically come into the same amount of COVID with the same amount of contact with the same person that had COVID. I didn't catch COVID. The other person did. Um, so could you talk about how that is at all possible and how perhaps one person's immune system may be able to fight off the microbes but the other person may get sick and infected with it yeah i mean this is a this is the crux of the, the whole pandemic this conversation isn't it i would say that you know from where I stand, I wouldn't be able to know exactly what went on in your body because I, you know, we don't have that data. We haven't studied that situation, but there's a few things that I think could be at play. Um, and I'm sure that there's many people who have similar stories, you know, their, their partner that they live with got COVID, they were in the same house coughing, whatever, and they never got it. And so there's probably a few things. It might be one or a combination of those things. The first thing is um, there's a set of genes in our body called the compatibility genes or the MHC, the major histocompatibility genes. And these are our immune system genes. And these make proteins that turn on our T and B cells. Those are the ones that are giving us immunity. Um, and we know that um, they're different in everyone. And they're what makes us most different. So it's not the genes that color our eyes or hair or skin it's actually these compatibility genes that are most the most diverse in the entire human genome and that diversity is is not by accident that's been crafted by evolution so that if we all were exposed to the same germ you'll get like a bell-shaped curve where most people will respond in the middle some people don't get any symptoms and some people get really sick so there's a small percentage on each end and then everything in between and that's for a reason because if we were all exposed to the same germ and it killed us all we would be wiped out as a species before we had vaccines and public health and medicines and all that kind of thing we wouldn't have survived this long so there's an inherent diversity so maybe your compatibility genes were on your side and they sparked a effective tmv cell response that meant you know you you, you might have had sim symptoms so mild that you were barely aware of it the other thing that might have been going on is that you didn't get exposed with a big enough dose. So we feel like there's some kind of dose dependent um, element to how much virus goes into your body. Um, and and there, then we can look at the side of your, your airways. How vulnerable are your airways? Maybe you've got a really good um, first line defense in your lungs. Maybe you didn't get exposed to enough. Um, the other thing that we can start to think about is um, whether you had pre-existing immunity from exposure to other um, coronaviruses that cause the common cold. So most of us will have be, had the common cold a few times in our life. We might have some lingering immunity, some antibodies that hop on and manage to attach to the SARS-CoV-2 um, before it causes a problem because it's kind of like a lock and key situation. They were made to a previous cold virus, but they, this, the lock and key still fits to the, the new SARS-CoV-2. And then it could just come down to your, your general fitness as well. If you're not with any risk factors and you're you know a healthy adult, you're not very old or very young or have an underlying health condition. So it could be kind of all these different layers mixed together um, that meant that you didn't end up getting the infection or any symptoms that you know of um, while you were exposed. Have you had it since in the- Yes, yes, I, I have had it. Uh, unfortunately, I've had it twice. Mm. Um, but okay, you know. so it's uh, a whole combination. <laughs> I thought I was immune at the time, but but I wasn't. But <laughs> thankfully, I, I I was very very mild with my my symptoms, so uh, you know, Great. I was still able to go about my day to day life. But obviously, mm -hmm. again, from from home, not not <laughs> you have home, to caveat that. Yeah, you have, to caveat you have that. the internet police going. Oh, he was he was going around spreading a history. <laughs> you, you never know. You, you do get a couple of odd comments from people. Um, <laughs> but I would love to kind of pick up on something because I'm sure someone would be listening now and they'd be going, "Well, you know, if I got this 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 sixth sense, um, you know, and we've kind of talked about." Uh, you know how it works with your T cells, um, and you know they, they'll be going well. If I've got this immune system, how 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 can I still get sick? Um, so I guess how would you kind of kind of answer that? 
I would say that, you know, your immune system is great. It's amazing. It does its job really well. You're exposed to loads of potential infections every day and you might get sick twice a year. You know, it's doing a really good job. But remember, there's no way to make yourself invincible unless you go and retreat to the hills and don't ever interact with another human on the planet. You will, you know, there's always a chance that you're going to get sick if you're exposed to any infectious germs and you don't know where they are because you can't see them. So getting sick is normal. Getting a couple of times a year as an adult, getting a minor infection is completely normal. It's when you get a um, higher frequency of infections, when they linger on, when you get unusual infections, that's normally a sign that your immune system is really not working for you. So I would say to people like, don't be afraid of germs. It is quite normal to get sick, but look at how well you recover and how frequently you get sick. Um, and you know, that the germs were here first, you know, we live in this germy world. So your immune system is great, but it's not like giving you this force field around you that means that you're impermeable to any germ ever. Um, and I think that's what gets really lost when people want to sell a simple solution. There's a lot of what I call immune washing that's happened since the um, pandemic. So, you know, greenwashing is when, brands and companies are saying that they're very environmentally conscious, but they're not actually doing the work to show that they have that environmental consciousness. And immune washing is the same thing. Brands are just smacking on, you know, immune boosting slogans onto their products because it might happen to contain something like vitamin C, uh, which is a nutrient that your immune system uses rather than, you know, just encouraging people to eat more fruit and vegetables. <laughs> So I think, you know, if anyone's really selling a, a simple solution uh, for your immune system, I'd cast a critical eye because it's way more complex than that. Of course, there's things we can do, but I would say it's about building the foundations most of the time so that when you do get sick, you need less intervention. You know, people always come to me when they get sick. What can I take to get me, you know, well again? And I'm like, well, there's some evidence that taking this and this might shorten the duration of your illness. But how healthy were you going into that illness? Were you extremely stressed by work? Were you very run down? Were you sleeping poorly? Had you really been neglecting your diet? You know, those are the things that we can work on little and often that's going to give us the best chance of, of minimizing the um, negative effects of, of being unwell. But it's not a pack of vitamin D tablets that you bought in April 2020. It's what you did. <laughs> in the years preceding yeah. that. <laughs> uh, so I just kind of love to ask you about that concept of, I guess, immune boosting that, you know, you see somewhere uh, a company will sell, uh, you know, a bottle of sunny delight and say, boosts your immune system or, or whatever it is that they do. Um, could you talk about how, uh, first of all, is it actually possible to boost one's immune system? Or does it kind of go back to what you said about earlier, where perhaps it's actually balancing the immune system that is perhaps more important? Yeah, I think that's that's a good way to put it, because if we think about when your immune system is turned on, that example that I gave earlier of um, a germ entering your airways and, and that sending that red flag to switch on inflammation, if you were to boost it, then you're basically exaggerating that response, but you're just going to end up damaging your tissues. And in fact, people who are hospitalized with COVID is because their immune system was overshooting. The off switch to control the inflammation wasn't working. And so really, we want to make sure we've got a good responding immune response, but we've also got that off switch that's really in place and ready to sort of tailor things so that it doesn't go over the top. So probably scientifically, the only correct way to use the term immune boosting would be with a vaccine booster. Um, but yeah, there's no product that can sort of boost your immune system um, per se, but there's certainly, you know, certain things when, when it comes to nutrition and nutrients that your immune system needs to function properly. And if you're deficient or low in one of those nutrients, then yes, your immune system may not function properly. But that goes for both the, the on switch and the off switch. And we tend to focus on things like vitamin C and zinc, but really any of the essential micronutrients. So the micronutrients are the vitamins and minerals that we have an essential daily requirement for it. You know, if you're deficient in, in vitamin D or the B vitamins or vitamin 
vitamin A, um, you know, or, or selenium or iron, then that could also mean that your immune system can't function properly. So you need to have the whole component um, present in your diet to make sure you're giving your immune system all the tools it needs to function. And it doesn't just stop at the vitamins and minerals. It's also things like fiber and protein, you know, and, and certain types of fats that are really important to this functioning. Yeah, I think this is perhaps a, a, a good um, point to, I guess, transition into some tools and some actionable tips that people can, can kind of use. But I suppose one thing that I was kind of um, thinking about in terms of uh, the balancing of the immune system. And um, one thing that I thought about was, you kind of mentioned earlier that um, one thing that's important is to, I guess, note about the frequency that you get sick with. You know, are you getting sick every mm -hmm. month? Are, are these illnesses, are they lingering around? And for me during 2021, I was sick all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's quite unusual for me. But honestly, it felt like every single month I was sick. Um, so I wonder if I could actually tie this into kind of what you're talking about. But I, 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 I would say fairly well. Um, I sleep very good. I, I've always made a point of exercising. But one thing that I realized during that year was that I was stressed constantly. I mean, I, I had all kinds of different life changes going on, academic pressures, all kinds of different things. And this resulted in me getting sick what felt like it was every month. Um, so I kind of made a point about that. And I kind of just made some, some uh, I would say some, uh, some changes some of it was out of my control for instance if you move you know that's stressful there's, there's not much you can do about that you just have to kind of probably but some of it was in my control and then since that point since about January I can't remember being sick at all so is a part of this that there's not a specific prescription for each person it's that you kind of have to experiment with different approaches to find out what works best for you yeah, I think that's a really, really nice way to put it. And in fact, in my most recent book that just came out this year, I tried to make people develop their own blueprint to that's specific to them. So there's a little questionnaire about how to figure out where you need to work the most. But it's looking at sort of five big dials. So it's the diet, but it's not just about what you eat. It's about your relationship to food um, and, you know, what drives you to eat. Because we don't just eat because we're hungry. We eat because of the food environment, the marketing around us. We're stressed. We're sad. So then we have to also work on the mental health aspect. We have to work on our stress, our emotional well-being, our social well-being. We know that that's quite strongly influencing how the immune system is functioning. So that's kind of the second dial. And we have things like sleep and rest you know are we overtraining um are we getting enough rest is our sleep of a good quality those are all going to affect how your immune system's working um then i have to remind myself what i've <laughs> got on each each so dial i have a little diagram um, yeah then there's you know movement i reframe exercise as movement because i just think exercise is like a really contrived thing that we do in a gym after eight hours of sitting at our desk and actually we now know that sitting all day and then going to the gym for an hour doesn't undo the negative effects of sitting all day so we just kind of need to move more um and then the environment in which we live and frequent you know we we don't often consider our environment as something that's important for our immune health but, you know, the air quality that you're breathing, sometimes air quality inside our house can be worse than that outside our house. Or if you live in a very polluted area of a city, um, if you live in a stressful, noisy environment, you know, that, that can also have an, a negative effect on our immune system. And so I get people to sort of write out these different dials and then consider how they can bump them up a notch or two so we're not talking that tomorrow you wake up you know new resolutions you're going to do everything perfectly you're going to eat well sleep well you know all the rest of it exercise well because you know what will happen you get to work something really stressful happens or if you're like me and you've got kids that you know the school rings and your kids are sick and you have to pick them up or you know it, something will derail your day and you get to the end of the day and your motivation has worn off because that's a finite resource and you open the fridge and instead of taking your time to chop all those vegetables and make this really nourishing meal you're tired you don't want to do that you're hungry kids are hungry you end up 
reaching for the things that are not going to support your health you don't go to the gym because you're just worn out from the mental load of the day and you get that trickle down effect but if you can start small and make that one tiny change so this week I'm just going to make one little tweak to my diet I'm just going to try and bump up my step count a little bit more um those will really add up over the the course of a year I think I had real like lived experience of that because before COVID, I was really, you know, burning candle at both ends, trying to juggle being a mum with young kids. Um, and I was knocked off my bike and broke my shoulder. And so I had my shoulder immobilized for a year. Um, and then I took it out of this sling and I couldn't move my arm because the muscle had all like withered away. Yeah. <laughs> and it got, uh, it was quite a traumatic experience. And I think all the, the, the brain muscle connection that was all kind of locked in. So I couldn't, I couldn't even lift my arm to get something out of the cupboard. And I was like, well, gosh, you know, if I don't do anything, I will never regain the ability to use my right arm. Uh, and so that was quite a big deal, but COVID happened. All the physio stopped, the gyms were closed. I couldn't do anything. Like I couldn't go anywhere to get rehabilitation. And so every day in the morning when I woke up, make a cup of tea, sit in the, the spare room and do these physio exercises, which were things like inching my hand up a pole and deep breathing to try and rela relax the arm. Um, uh, and then, you know, from I also couldn't do normal exercise. So I had to find different ways of moving. There was no option to go to the gym. But honestly, within the two years, I completely reframed how I look at things. I think I, I was fitter and healthier at the end of two years of just trying to drip feed these small little things into my day rather than saying, oh, I must go to the gym three times a week or I must do this perfectly. Um, and it really made me see how those tiny little things add up. And I like this concept of the aggregation of marginal gains. So, you know, is it... Um, can't remember Brailsford the chap who was in charge of the Sky cycling team at the London Olympics and he had that strategy where if we what if we tweak lots of little things and all those one percents add up and then we're going to elevate the training and the outcomes of our of our cycling team and then the they, they swept a load of gold medals didn't they and they did amazing and I just thought actually you know there's we're quick to dismiss that because we want the big things we want to invest in our health by spending money on a supplement and we think is going to give us this magical change uh, imagining it's a back door where we don't have to do all the foundational stuff but you you know you still need to work on the foundations and so yeah I really hope that that I can convey that to people in some way that would inspire them to let go of the big changes that are hard to sustain and go for these tiny little you know knocking it up a notch or two right and and this is an idea that we've talked about on the show that is far better to be good most of the time than to be great mm -hmm. you know once or twice if you eat mcdonald's food every day but then you know you have a bone broth on a sunday night or whatever i don't think that's gonna <laughs> exactly <laughs> too much for you but you raise a really good point and it actually t takes me back to a a newsletter that i wrote um and it's kind of i guess from somewhat of a different field but it's kind of links in i think where uh i was interested in the concepts of negative feedback loops and this is particularly mm -hmm. the case in depression where someone feels depressed and they feel less like exercising they feel less like socializing and in turn that makes them more depressed uh, so i become really interested in the inverse of this in positive feedback loops and I, I i made the case in this newsletter that if you start your day and you get the first meal right mm -hmm. you have this fantastic first meal of the day then that will cascade to to other areas of of your life if if you start the day off and uh you know you wake up and you grab a mcmuffin from mcdonald's in your mind the the subconscious message is you know i, I don't need to put much much effort into that um you know I, i'm the type of person that will take shortcuts but i hypothesized the opposite i said if you put time and effort into it and you're very conscious about it uh you feel really good about yourself in turn when you get to work you're more likely to to do the things that you need to do to get to the places that you want to go. So I wonder if that kind of ties into to your 
uh, message. Oh, definitely. And I, I put um, it in this in this book, I did write a lot about um, the idea of front loading your day, mm. which is exactly as you've described. Uh, and I know that, you know, from personal experience, my motivation wears off as the day goes on. It isn't a limitless um, resource that we have, but we do wake up with perhaps more motivation than we do at maybe at 6 p.m. when we come in from work or whatever. So capitalize on that and, you know, get those little things in early in the day and it does start you off in the right trajectory and you know if you do have a good breakfast uh, or a good start to your morning everyone's kind of different in what their preferences are then you probably feel a bit better and you do have that positive reward thing so the um uh, this the feedback to your brain um that's maybe going to encourage you to make better choices as the day progresses and the motivation wears off so i do think there's there's something in that um i do I, when i was writing i was really struggling with how to sort of personalize that because i'm a morning person so i'm very much like i'll i want to front load my day with all the good stuff um but my husband is a real night owl so he's kind of the opposite so i do think that you know people have to kind of tailor it to their own patterns and preferences but whatever you prefer i think trying to get things done in the first part of the day is going to set you up for better decisions as the day wears on Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And I think that there's been kind of um, so much, uh, I think, real um, insight in this this conversation. Um, perhaps, I guess, as we kind of um, wind down, I want to ask you kind of a couple of fun questions that I saw uh, in the book that I'd kind of like to, to ask you about. Um, so when, uh, so the first question I'm going to ask you, but I want to uh, preface it in it preface it in a, a way that will will tie into the question so when the cost of bills skyrocketed in the UK in the last month or so I was speaking to my dad and I remember um he told me that the cost of bills had gone up so much that he was considering removing the boiler from the house <laughs> and he was and he was telling me that he wants to to go out and buy all these coats and he said to my mother in, in jest, he said, you know, he said, you need to go and buy a nice, nice coat because we're never putting the heating on again. He <laughs> oh said all this my. in a joke, anyway, but I, I do think that some people will kind of be experiencing this. Yeah, yeah. So sure. I would love to kind of ask, can being in a cold house make you sick? Oh, yeah, this is a great question. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure many of us might have been told by our parents or grandparents at some point, like, don't go out in the cold without your coat on, um, because you'll get sick. So there's a few things in that. Firstly, you'll only get sick if you come in contact with an infectious germ. Um, and that can happen whether you're cold or not, whether you've got your coat on or not. I would say that getting cold for prolonged periods of time can induce that stress response. And if you're already stressed, you've got a heavy life load, then it that might suppress your immune system, which means if you do come in contact with a germ, you're more vulnerable to getting an infection. But in short, no, being cold doesn't necessarily mean that you'll catch a cold. That's a, a, a lot of people are going, what, what, what? <laughs> I love it. And I suppose that that's um, kind of different to, uh, I guess, the concept of, of homesis. Mm -hmm. this kind of um uh what doesn't kill you makes you stronger yeah. kind of acute stress like for instance taking a cold shower yeah. which to my knowledge has some benefits right yeah exactly and you know i live in brighton by the sea so i quite regularly get in the sea and there's huge communities of sea swimmers um and there is some evidence that they are have better immune systems if you're exposed to the cold, but you also have to remember they're also exercising, there's a social network involved, and you're out in the fresh air getting vitamin D and, you know, starting your day in a really nice way. Um, so we have to sort of take those studies with a little bit of, uh, you know, caveat uh, that it's not just about being in the cold, but I certainly think cold showers, ice baths, you know, I have a sauna in my garden, when when I get rid of my kids trampoline when they're too old for it I'm getting a nice bath too but I would say that you know it's not for everyone because it is really tapping into your nervous system it's tapping into the stress response and so I think that yes 
cold is a great way of putting yourself in a controlled environment where you're switching on that stress response you want to do it you want to have the cold shower the ice bath the sea swim um so and you're controlling how long you get in there for so it's a good way of almost future proofing you against future stresses but at the same time if you're already a broken human the last thing you need to be doing is pushing yourself into some extreme environment um and so i think that goes with anything like you know extreme exercise when you're already crippled under the pressures of your job or your life so it's kind of like it's not for everyone it's a great tool if you're in the right position to do that right right yeah absolutely that's a really great way to put it um and i think this conversation really illuminates the kind of complex systems and all the different factors that we need to take into context um, when we're looking at, at our immune system. Um, another fun one that I'd love to pick up from the book, you, you put a page about tattoos. Uh, <laughs> could you talk about this? Oh, yeah, I thought this was just a, a kind of little quirky fun A little thing. quirky thing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually, we have these immune cells that live um, uh, under our skin. They're called macrophages. They're quite big, chunky cells, and they eat things, so they'll eat things that get inside your body. Um, and they eat the tattoo ink, and they are the reason that you have a tattoo in place, because the ink sits inside these giant cells, these giant immune cells. Um, which I thought was quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, it was a very, very interesting point. Um, a couple more that I'd just love to ask. I'd just like to ask you just a couple more questions. Um, what would be one practice uh, or um, kind of routine that you do in your own personal life that you think has really contributed to you being healthier more vibrant better relationships it could be bio biological it could be psychological but just if you've got one tip that you feel has really contributed to you functioning better do i have to choose one <laughs> <laughs> um i would say um you know taking i would say muscle mass so in introducing resistance exercise into my life not in a way to become a bodybuilder or you know have huge muscles but to offset the muscle loss that happens to all of us with aging right from our 30s and it increases every decade because muscle tissue is very rejuvenating for the immune system so it helps keep it young and we know that immune aging is something that's really associated with greater susceptibility to infection but our immune age doesn't always match our chronological age but those who have greater muscle mass because they're using their muscles in their 80s 90s it's uh, giving a better immune system and i guess the other thing just to add is is you know having a good relationship with food because so many of us have a really disordered relationship with food and we live in a really difficult challenging food environment we're bombarded with confusing messages with big food companies selling us the idea that we need all this you know marketed stuff um you can't move outside of your home without you know being told that you need to buy snacks and have food and uh i think it's really difficult for people to make those choices like you said earlier you know when you've got it all around you and you're a bit worn down by life you're going to default to the tasty yummy option that might not necessarily be the best thing for you but if you can sort of have that pause and that awareness piece come in but why you're eating is it because you're hungry and you're furnishing your body with what it needs or is it because you're a bit sad and a bit lonely i think then you can start to look at different tools to deal with those um more difficult challenging emotions rather than sort of defaulting to food which might then have other impacts down the line like um changing you know body weight and that kind of thing I love that point. I love that point. Um, I got one last question for you, and then I'll ask you um, kind of to sign off and tell our audience where they can connect with you and future work and anything that you're excited about um, to share with us. The last question that we sign off all of our podcasts with is what makes a life worth living? Oh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, challenging yourself, um you know 
I, I just think for me, I've, I'm, I'm quite an introvert. I'm, I was always quite a shy person. I was never the one to put my hand up and ask questions, but I've continually put myself out of my comfort zone and it's helped me grow. And I just, I, you know, I teach now at the university and I see loads of students just crippled with, with anxiety and everything. And I just think, you know, embrace the unknown and the uncertainty and little by little put yourself out of your comfort zone and watch yourself grow and it's then it's having that amazing feedback um and I think that would be you know when I look back all of the challenging things are the things that I might you know didn't want to do but are the things that have helped me grow the most and that makes me feel like yes it was a life worth lived or living whatever <laughs> however you put it beautifully said um where can our audience connect with you uh jenna and is there anything that you would like to direct them to anything that you're particularly excited about that they should check out yeah Take i mean uh instagram is where i'm most active um so i'm sure you can share the handle i have a bit of a confusing surname to spell uh the new book just came out in february um so I'm still sort of doing a bit of the promotion for that. Uh, but I've started thinking about a third one. I want to write about kids' immune systems because I get so many questions on that. So if people do have questions, let me know what those are so I can try and cover that in my research. Um, I'm also on Twitter sometimes, so you can find me there. And I have a newsletter that goes out every month, um, which you can sign up to on my website. But I always love connecting with people. I love hearing people's questions um, about the immune system or any way that I can help so reach out to me on social um, because it's always great to interact.